During the 1980s, Japan was a country in the midst of one giant party, one that could be heard from all corners of the world but only enjoyed by those living within it. Stocks were constantly in the green, real estate prices were high, the economy was booming, just about everyone was able to make money in one way or another, and people were not afraid to spend. It was a kingdom of wealth and a time of prosperity, optimism and euphoria. At the time, it was thought by many that Japan was on track to become the world's largest economic player. But how did this happen? What was life like for those who lived through this economic miracle? And what caused this party to abruptly end? In the decades following the Second World War, Japanese society underwent significant changes. People were living frugally, saving large portions of their income. The middle and upper class were expanding, with more workers being offered lifetime employment at large conglomerates, known as keidetsu. These monolithic conglomerates are effectively a set of companies composed of various independent entities that are spread out across multiple industries and are usually organized around financiers such as banks. While the individual companies remain financially independent, as a whole they act as an interconnected network in order to ensure each other's success through cross shareholdings and financial support. These keidetsus received significant support from the Japanese government which led to the term Japan Inc being coined by Western rivals due to the fact that it encouraged unfair trading policies that fueled Japan's growth at the expense of Western companies. During the 1970s, Japanese companies began mobilizing on the ongoing oil crisis in the West by exporting cheaper and more fuel efficient cars. By the end of the decade, they had achieved a competitive edge over their Western rivals by focusing on innovating their manufacturing methods. While the US was assembling cars by hand, Japan had eliminated all human error by using assembly line robots. Moving into the early 80s, Japan had also started to make a mark on the global electronics and computer industry. Aided by robots and cheap labor, Japanese companies were able to produce high quality components that could be exported and sold at a much cheaper rate compared to Western companies. Japan eventually established its dominance through revolutionary products such as the Sony Walkman and VHS recorder. This dominance was further cemented when companies such as Sega and Nintendo effectively monopolized the video game industry with the release of products such as Donkey Kong, Super Mario Bros, as well as consoles such as the Nintendo Entertainment System and later on the Game Boy. All of these developments led to a healthy rise in Japan's GDP up until until the first half of the 1980s. At this point, Japan's GDP per capita eclipsed many Western countries. The average standard of living drastically improved and people had more money in savings than ever before. However, this was only the beginning. What followed was an era of rapid, uncontrolled growth and change that would leave a permanent mark on Japanese society. In the early 1980s, the US dollar appreciated in value by over 47%, which made importing goods from overseas far cheaper. This put pressure on US-based manufacturers and caused several large companies such as IBM to lobby Congress to intervene. In 1985, the US, Japan and several other nations signed the Plaza Accord, which was an agreement to weaken the US dollar relative to the Japanese yen. The aim of this was to address the growing US trade deficits and allow American companies to better export their goods around the world. As a result of this agreement, the Japanese yen sharply appreciated in value, which in turn caused Japanese companies to suffer major losses in exports due to the fact that they had to sell their products in the States at much higher prices than before. Unexpectedly, the value of the yen then further increased due to speculators purchasing the yen and selling the dollar. This had a negative impact on Japan's growth rate since at the time, the export surplus was Japan's main main source of growth. This decrease in the growth rate caused Japan to experience recessionary pressures, which the Bank of Japan responded to by slashing interest rates in 1986. These low interest rates incentivized people to take out loans, which the banks were more than happy to give out. Employment rates were low, and a population which traditionally practiced frugality began seeing more people shifting funds from savings to financial markets. All of these macroeconomics together fueled a massive asset bubble. Overconfidence in the banks, combined with excessive lending and speculative investing caused the stock and real estate markets to skyrocket to inconceivable levels. From 1985 to 1989, Japan's Nikkei stock index tripled, peaking in 1989 at 38,915 points, making Japan the world's second largest economy behind the US. Japan's growth was spiraling out of control. To put things in perspective, the Greater Tokyo area had a GDP larger than that of the entire United Kingdom. Tokyo real estate was selling at around $140,000 per square foot, which was almost 350 times as much as the equivalent space in Manhattan. By 1988, Japan's total land value was worth four times all of the land in the United States, and by 1989, Japan accounted for 45% of the global stock market. 
In the space of just a few decades, Japan had transformed into a capitalist fantasy on its way to becoming the world's greatest economic player. But what was life like for those living within the bubble during this era of optimism and prosperity? Fuel was further added to the fire as people started pumping money that they had borrowed using cheap loans into real estate and stock markets and then borrowing against their newly appreciated holdings in order to buy even more. Due to this cycle of excessive and borderline reckless investing, stocks were becoming increasingly overvalued, with many believing that they'll just keep on rising. There was a strong sense of Japan being different from other economies, money was flowing and people began living increasingly more flamboyant lives. The Japanese public were encouraged by the government to spend, and out of the booming economy and spending frenzy came many stories of extravagance and luxury. 500 dollar cups of coffee sprinkled with gold dust were reportedly drunk by housewives in Osaka as it was believed to bring about good health. Businessmen were reportedly spending upwards of 200 thousand dollars in a single night of partying and people would famously wave the equivalent of 100 dollar bills in the air on Saturday nights just to get the attention of a taxi driver in Tokyo. Golf became a sport of exclusivity with the most exclusive club memberships costing upwards of 3 million dollars. The release of the 1987 romance film, Take Me Out to Snowland, catalyzed a huge skiing boom, with many ski resorts being constructed thanks to the abundance of money and the thriving economy. This crazy buying spree also spread overseas as Japanese businesses and individuals started buying up parts of the globe, from movie studios and resorts to skyscrapers and famous landmarks. Known as the world's first and only luxury mass market, Increasingly more Japanese tourists were going overseas to buy luxury goods, from Armani suits to Gucci handbags. It was reported that one woman bought an entire jewellery shop in Italy, and in 1987, Van Gogh's Vase with 15 Flowers was famously purchased for $39 million by a Japanese insurance tycoon. Japan's nightlife scene was also taking off in a big way, and visits to expensive and popular venues was a sign of status, and out of the flashing lights and neon signs of Japan's city life, new forms of fashion and music were born. Bodycon, short for body conscious, was a fashion trend that emerged in late 1985 and was extremely popular amongst young women. It was categorized by its tight fitting and form revealing style and usage of neon colors such as pink, purple and yellow. City pop, which was a mix of various genres such as funk, soft rock and boogie, peaked in popularity in the 80s and was a reflection of the bustling city life and problem free lifestyle that many were experiencing. In some ways, it was almost a perfect soundtrack to the dreamlike, euphoric state that the country was experiencing. But just like a dream, it was short-lived and ultimately fake. The Japanese economic bubble of the 1980s was a time of unprecedented growth and prosperity. However, by 1989, the party was over. Concerns about Japan's rapidly growing asset bubble led the Bank of Japan to raise interest rates, resulting in a ripple effect that caused asset prices to crash. The nation was left with the hangover of a dizzying party, and many individuals and companies struggled to cope with the fall from grace. The fallout of the bubble's collapse was immense. Japan's stock market, the Nikkei, crashed by over 50% in less than a year and continued to decline until 1992 wiping out billions in wealth. The country's edge and exports also began to fade as other Asian countries like China emerged as major global exporters. As the crisis deepened, reports of corruption began to surface, revealing a darker side of Japanese society. Insider trading, bribery, stock manipulation and fraud were seemingly present in all aspects of Japanese society from government officials to companies and individuals. The decade that followed the bubble's collapse is often referred to as the lost decade, the economy stagnated, growth was slow, and the country battled deflation and weak banks. Even today, Japan is still dealing with the lasting effects of the bubble's collapse and the once great nation is still grappling with low interest rates and other economic challenges. As we look back on the bubble economy of 1980s Japan, we must remember the lessons learned, we must recognize the dangers of overvalued assets, over speculation and unchecked growth. We must strive to create more sustainable economic systems, ones that benefit all members of society. Thank you for watching and may we all learn from Japan's past to build a better economic future.